Does anyone have any trusted tools? Um, I'm I'm sure that there's a a good bit of diversity in the room in terms of what uh, jobs, skills, hobbies we might have. Um, But I found that whenever you care about doing something well or you spend a lot of time doing something, um, you put enough hours in, eventually you'll, you'll come to figure out what works for you, what tools you particularly uh, appreciate to help you do the job. Uh, others on staff here uh, at Calvary know that if I'm going to take notes with paper and pen, you will always see me with this right here, the Zebra F301. Whether blue or black, this is my go-to pen. Um, I'm a little bit of a pen connoisseur, and I'm sure there are better pens out there than this, but in terms of it feeling solid, writing well, being reliable, uh, not being too expensive, this is my, uh, this is my pen. Um, if, you, if you do something a lot, you find a tool that you can trust. If you're a painter, uh, you probably have a favorite type of brush and paint. Um, if you're a contractor, you probably have a favorite set of, of tools um, or favorite brand of power tools. If you're a runner, you probably have your, your type of shoe that you know is perfect for you. Does anyone here have any favorite tools? I'm curious. Yeah, Anna? Your paintbrushes. You've got your particular brushes. You know what you like. What am I going to do when I get really excited? Yeah, yeah. It's like, the, you know, everything, you know, when you found that thing, um, I knew a guy um, who did carpentry and he had his hammer. And it's like, you know, no other hammer compares to that hammer. It's like, you know, um, a- anyone else? Favorite, any favorite tools? What was that? Photoshop. Yeah, if you spend a lot of time trying to edit things, it's like you find the program, probably get it set up, you get the tips and tricks set up the way that you want. Um, I have, uh, I use Logos Bible software, and I've kind of got my, there's different windows, and I've got my screen arranged just the way that I want. I've got a workflow that's good for me. It's kind of my, you you set it up right. Yeah, like you find the tool that works for you. Anyone else? Fender guitars. Fender guitars. (laughs) Yeah, you, no, no, no other guitar is the same for you. you. You find what works and you stick with it. Um, in our passage for this morning, uh, Paul is writing to Timothy. And if you've been with us, you know that Timothy is his spiritual protege, his son in the faith. Uh, Paul knows his end is near, his time is short. He's expecting to be killed for his faith in the very near future. And Timothy, he's kind of passed the baton for leadership, particularly for the church in Ephesus, to Timothy, who's now pastoring this church. Timothy's a young pastor who's kind of been thrust into the spotlight. And Paul is writing Timothy to encourage him, to embolden him in his gospel ministry. And as, been, as we've been working through this book of 2 Timothy this summer, we've seen that, that these words are not just for Timothy, nor are they just for pastors or elders. Uh, but that they speak to all of us. They are relevant today in every one of our situations, for, for everyone in the family of God. And in the passage that was read for us by Audrey just a few minutes ago, we see Paul describing the kind of tool that God likes to use. Essentially, you know, when God reaches into his tool belt or when God opens up his tool chest, Paul kind of reveals the, the, the tool that's God's go-to, the, the, the tool that he likes to reach for, essentially the kind of people that he wants to use to accomplish his purposes. And it isn't the kind of people that we might initially expect. Uh, if you're like me, you probably uh, expect God to use people with impressive abilities or strengths or gifts. Certainly spiritual gifts play a part of all of this and God has gifted us in particular ways to enable us to build up others in the church. But spiritual gifts are not the main criteria being used by God when he wants to find someone to use. And we all know gifted people who are having very little impact for the gospel. Similarly, we expect uh, perhaps God to use the knowledgeable and the educated. Uh, People with a great knowledge of the Bible, perhaps someone who has gone to seminary, as we saw a few weeks ago from earlier in chapter 2. 
Uh, Being knowledgeable in the Bible is incredibly important. We need to know how to rightly handle the word of truth. We need need to know how to confront heresy and false doctrine and, and teach and build people up. But as we've all seen in the news and perhaps some of us have experienced firsthand, you can know the Bible and have a long list of degrees next to your name and yet bring terrible disgrace uh, to the cause of Christ. In fact, sometimes those degrees put you in a, uh, they, they allow you to do greater damage because you're in a position of greater influence. More people are looking to you expecting to see a role model and, and so no matter how many degrees you have, that's no guarantee that God is going to use you. And we might also expect God to use those with uh, worldly influence and resources, the wealthy who can simply write a check and stuff happens, um, who, uh, the, the, the powerful who can pull strings and you know, make a couple of phone calls and, and things fall into place. Uh, the, the popular who can easily persuade millions of adoring fans to, to do or, or to live a certain way. This is how the world works, but it's not how God works. God doesn't restrict his blessing for the rich and powerful, and the knowledgeable and educated, those who are naturally gifted or charismatic or interesting. Our text this morning tells us that when God wants to change the world, When God wants to save sinners, when God wants to address injustice and transform culture, the the, the tool that God reaches for, the kind of person that God wants to use is a cleansed person, a cleansed person. If you want to make a difference with your life, then this truth should be an incredible encouragement to you because not all of us will be rich and powerful. Not all of us will will go to seminary and get degrees or get doctorates in this or that. Uh, Most of us will never have uh, millions of Twitter followers or whatever uh, social media of choice. Like We are not all going to be in these worldly positions of influence. And that's that's, that's okay because that is not God's go-to tool. When God wants to do something, when God wants to make a difference, he doesn't look for the rich and powerful, he looks for cleansed people. The simple message of our passage this morning is that God uses cleansed people, um, and particularly those who are defined by two characteristics. They flee sin and they pursue godliness. They flee sin and they pursue godliness. To make this point clear, Paul uses an illustration We're in 2 Timothy chapter 2, starting in verse 20, and uh, and he uses this illustration of a large house. He says, uh, in a large house, there are articles not only of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay. Some are for noble purposes, some are for ignoble. If a man cleanses himself from the latter, he will be an instrument for noble purposes, made holy, useful to the master, and prepared to do any good work. Uh, the Greek word uh, for articles here is, is basically a word that means things, uh, utensils, vessels. It's, it's a pretty broad term that can refer to any number of, of object. But, but based on the context, it's pretty clear uh, what Paul has in mind. He's talking specifically about serving ware, plates, bowls, containers, utensils, the kinds of tools that someone would use if they were to cook uh, or serve a meal. The gold and silver vessels are kept clean. They're, they're ready uh, so that if, if people are going to come over, you can serve guests, you can host a dinner party. The wood and clay vessels, on the other hand, would be for dishonorable purposes, such as holding kitchen scraps or garbage or human waste. Anyone here know what a thunder bucket is? <laughs> anyway, here, here. So uh, I grew up in a... You know, my mom actually had uh, a thunder bucket. It's kind of this old thing that was kind of passed on. It's kind of a funny thing to pass along, but it was this this old uh, bucket essentially that um, if if you lived in the days without indoor plumbing, and it's you know middle of January or February, and you're in New England, and you think I don't want to go outside to the outhouse. You slide the thunder bucket out from under the bed, and there you go. 
Uh, the, you, you do your business in the thunder bucket, and then when you're ready, you take it outside and, 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 and dump it in the woods or whatever the case might be. Um, the ancient equivalent of a thunder bucket is essentially what Paul has in mind here when he talks about um, articles of wood and clay for ignoble purposes. The kinds of things that hold garbage, uh, the, the, the wood and clay, they're disposable, they're breakable. They didn't have you know, uh, th- disposable styrofoam things back then. This was their disposable item. Easily broken, cheaply replaced. Um, and, and so he's saying there are these two types of things in the house. There's the, the gold and silver that's clean. It's ready to go. You can host a party with it. And then you've got the, the wood and clay stuff that's set aside for the kitchen scraps, the waste, the garbage. Now, it would be easy to misunderstand or to misapply Paul's point here. You could look at this passage and, and, and logically jump to the conclusion that both types of utensils are necessary. They, they, they both serve legitimate functions. We need bowls to serve meals to guests, and we need thunder buckets to uh, do our dirty business in, and, uh, and both serve a purpose. Both are necessary. It's fine to be either. <laughs> it's clear that that is not the point Paul is making. Oh, that, 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 that both are necessary, both are legitimate, so just pick whichever one you want. Um, Paul makes clear that, that no one should be a vessel or instrument for dishonor. The Bible is clear that uh, that God is sovereign. Uh, he is the, the sovereign of the universe. And that he uses even evil people for his righteous purposes. He uses Satan and uh, the demons, even though they're opposed to him, as much as they want to fight against him. And all of their fighting against God, unwittingly they end up furthering God's purposes. In Moses' day, God raised up Pharaoh and used him in and through all of Pharaoh's corrupt heart and evil intentions and sinful actions. Even through that, God accomplished his purposes and displayed his power through Pharaoh. In the New Testament, God used Judas in his plan of putting Jesus on the cross. Uh, It wasn't Judas's intent to further God's purposes, but even in his sinfulness, God is stronger. God is sovereign. God is over all of that. No one gets in God's way. No one thwarts his purposes. God is in control. As Proverbs 16.4 puts it, the Lord has made everything for its own purpose, even the wicked for the day of evil. God will get glory from your life whether you like it or not. Um, That's the God that we have. He will either use you in this life, in your evil, to accomplish his purposes, or he will get glory in your judgment by displaying his holy and righteous wrath against your sin and rebellion. God can use you either as a vessel of honor or a vessel of dishonor, but it makes a great difference to you which you are. C.S. Lewis once said that uh, you will certainly carry out God's purpose however you act, but it makes a difference to you whether you serve like Judas or like John. You know, g- God will get glory from you. God will accomplish his purposes. Um, and, and God has and will and does use evil, sinful people who have no desire to, to honor him. Um, d- d- despite all of their efforts, God still accomplishes things through them. But here he's saying, don't be like that. Don't be, don't be a, a vessel for dishonorable use. Uh, you be the kind of person who is cleansed and ready because God doesn't, uh, God doesn't want to bring his gospel to the world through a trash bucket. Um, have you ever been at a restaurant and uh, you're sitting there and you're about to eat and you realize on your fork there's some like crusted egg from a previous meal or something like that or, or at the edge of your plate or perhaps from the dishwasher on the inside of your, your water glass, there's some stuff kind of stuck to the inside. Uh, anyone here, you know, not ashamed to like get your server's attention and say, can I get a new plate, a new fork, a new glass, a new whatever it takes? Like, I, I don't want my meal on this And in this passage, God is saying he doesn't want to serve a glorious, beautiful gospel on a dirty plate. 
with, dirt, with dirty, uh, nasty utensils. This is essentially what Paul is trying to uh, make clear. God uses cleansed people. But notice, however, the emphasis in verse 21 is on the responsibility of each of us to be cleansed people. Look at verse 21. If a man cleanses himself from the latter, that is, dishonorable, ignoble purposes, he will be an instrument for noble purposes, made holy, useful to the master, prepared to do any good work. If a man cleanses himself from the latter. When when Paul says that a man needs to cleanse himself, um, he's not teaching that by our own efforts we can atone for our sins. You know, like you, you, you've, you've piled up a bunch of bad things, but if you do enough good things, you'll be clean. That's not what Paul is saying, as if we can atone for ourselves, as if, as if we can clean ourselves in that way. Um, not at all. If, if we could do anything in and of ourselves to deal with our sin problem before God, the death of Christ would be a pointless. But you can and must avail yourself of the means of cleansing that God has provided in Christ. That is each of our responsibility. If if you were to be out, and you've probably done this this summer, if you have a lawn or a garden or something like that, if you were to spend a number of hours outside, you know, digging around, getting dirty, getting stuff accomplished, mowing the lawn, whatever it might be, um, when, when you come inside, you don't clean yourself like a cat, you know, like, like that, that you are fully cleaning yourself. No, you go to the, bo- the bathroom and you avail yourself of some soap and water. You can't clean yourself, but the means of you becoming clean are made available and you take advantage of them. The same is true when it comes to Christ. God provided the blood of Jesus as the means of cleansing us from our sins. And there's a sense in which we are uh, completely clean the moment we trust in Christ our Savior. We are declared righteous in God's sight. But we walk in the world, we get defiled, we give in to sin. And when we confess our sins, the blood of of Jesus, we we apply the blood of Jesus to our dirty lives in the way that we would apply soap to dirty hands. To to be a vessel for honor, you need to uh, walk in the light, confessing known sin to God. Vessels of dishonor walk in the darkness and do not cleanse themselves from sin. And so Paul puts a choice out to Timothy and to us. That this choice that we need to make, are we going to choose to be cleansed people? Not because we can clean ourselves fully of ourselves, but are we going to be cleansed people in the sense that we take advantage of the means of cleansing that God has made possible for us in Jesus Christ? There are three descriptions of cleansed people that make them ready to accomplish God's purposes. Uh, Paul describes them here as holy, useful, and prepared. That when you are cleansed to God, you are holy, useful, and prepared. I want to look at each of those briefly. The word holy uh, could be translated sanctified. Uh, it basically means something that is set apart. Uh, so Israel were, were, was God's holy people. They were set apart. He's saying, I'm, I'm setting you apart from the world to be about my business. Even among them, the Levites particularly were a holy people. They were set aside to be priests. The land of Israel was a holy uh, place set aside for God's purposes, and particularly the temple and the holy of holies was set aside for God's purposes. For something to be holy, it means it's consecrated from worldly use, separated from worldly use, and designated for God's purposes. Um, and, And so... Uh, He's saying that when we are cleansed, when we are trusting in Christ's forgiveness, we're confessing our sin, we're seeking his will, that we are, in that way, we are set apart for his purposes. Uh, The word useful refers to something that is helpful, something that works as it should, something that's made for the task at hand. Uh, If you needed to hammer a a nail into a board, you might be able to get the job done with a rock. Um, You know, if if you work hard enough, it it, it might it might do the job, but it's not really made for that. It's not going to work all that well. Um, 
if, if, if you want to do something right, you want a tool that's designed for the purpose that you have. And as I said before, God can use sinful people to accomplish his purposes, but it's like hammering a nail with a rock instead of a hammer. God wants us to be cleansed people, perfectly suited for exactly what he wants to do through us. When we're cleansed, we are holy, set apart, we are useful, uh, fit for exactly what he wants. Thirdly, we are prepared, uh, prepared uh, to do any good work. Uh, the idea of prepared, as, as, it, as we would expect, means to be, to be willing and ready. Uh, the cleansed vessel is waiting for the master. It's sitting on the shelf, clean and ready to go. Um, if something is cleansed, you don't have to like quick clean it up when people are coming. It's, you're ready to pull off the shelf. It's ready to go. Have you ever been angry, bickering with your spouse or children or something like that, and then were presented an opportunity to witness for Christ? You weren't prepared. You know, like you're just not in that mindset. When, when you're still stewing in anger, you are not a prepared vessel for God's work. You're kind of in this funk of selfishness and frustration and bitterness. You're not ready to go. You're not cleansed. Or if you've ever, ever been grumbling uh, about something, uh, been discouraged or, or kind of in some little moment of, of self-pity, and then you encounter a brother or sister in need of a word of encouragement. Uh, we've probably all been in that situation. Most of us probably don't even realize it when we're there because we're so focused on ourselves and the woe is me and oh, this stinks that we're probably blind to our friend's need for encouragement. We're, we're, we're not prepared vessels. We're so inwardly focused on ourselves. We're not ready to be used by the master at a moment's notice. If you're cleansed, you're ready. You're ready to serve the Lord in any good work that he sets before you. That's the point in verses 20 and 21. God uses cleansed people. But as I said earlier, God uses cleansed people who are defined by two characteristics. They, they flee sin and they pursue godliness. This helps to explain what it means to be cleansed. To be a cleansed person means that you are the kind of person that runs away from sin and that pursues, that runs after godliness. Now we see this spelled out in verse 22. Flee the evil desires of youth and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace along with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. It's important that we not miss this contrast uh, between fleeing and pursuing. Uh, it, it's a common dynamic, especially uh, in the New Testament. Um, we're supposed to put off certain behaviors and put on other behaviors. This kind of, this, these two, like something said negatively and positively um, are important. And here it's really stressed. These are, these are opposite terms. Uh, to flee uh, means to seek safety in flight, um, to, to, to escape. It's used literally to describe people who run away from danger as when Moses fled from Pharaoh's wrath or when Jesus, Mary, and Joseph fled from Herod's wrath. In the same way, this, this word fleeing, about fleeing physical danger, is used figuratively to describe fleeing spiritual danger. We are to flee idolatry, uh, flee immorality. We are to flee greed and materialism. Cleansed people pay attention to what things might be damaging to them spiritually, that, that might be dangerous to the soul, and they don't play around with it. They don't sit and linger in it like Lot in Sodom. They, they, they flee, they, they get away. Like Joseph, when, when Potiphar's wife attempted to seduce him, uh, she grabs his cloak and he just takes off. Just get out of there. Cleansed people don't sit in sin. They don't play with sin. They don't make excuses for hanging out in sin. They flee it. The verb pursue is the exact opposite. Uh, if fleeing is running away from something, pursuing is to chase after it. Uh, means to run after or to chase. Uh, more than 30 times this word that's used here, pursue, um, is translated in the New Testament, persecute. 
persecuted. It's the same word that Paul uses when he describes his pre-conversion life where he was pursuing the church. He was persecuting the church. He was going after them with a vengeance. He was putting his whole heart into finding every Christian he could so that he could throw them in jail, so that he could have them killed, whatever it might be. He pursued Christians. He, He persecuted them with passion and energy and determination. We are to have that kind of mindset, that kind of approach, that kind of vigilance in our pursuit of the things of God. We are to run away from spiritual danger and to run after spiritual good. Specifically, Paul tells Timothy to flee the evil desires of youth. I suspect that when we hear that phrase, the evil desires of youth, uh, I suspect that many of us have in mind sexual temptation. And that might be part of it. Certainly, uh, while hormones are raging, uh, youth are particularly prone to uh, sexual temptation. But I think Paul has more in mind uh, here. I think he's thinking more broadly than that. Uh, Calvin, John Calvin, understood it as the propensity of younger men to lose their tempers and rush forward into a heated argument with more confidence and rashness than men of a riper age do. In the same vein, Gordon Fee says that Paul is speaking of headstrong passions of youth who sometimes love novelties, foolish discussions, and arguments that all too often lead to quarrels. William Barclay related it to the faults of impatience, self-assertion, love of arguing, and love of novelty that stem from youthful idealism. If you remember the the broader context of this passage, uh, we've taken a couple weeks off from 2 Timothy while I was on vacation, but the broader context is about false doctrine, false teaching, um, and and the importance of, of not only fleeing and and getting away from that false teaching, but in correcting and how do you rightly address false teaching in the church and all of these speculations and worthless arguments that arise. And uh, so here, as he's talking about fleeing the the evil desires of youth, um, certainly I think sexual temptation can be in that, but I think partly he's addressing this broader temptation to to give into this uh, youthful desire to be proven right, to show yourself right. It doesn't always leave when you grow up, but you know, this particularly youthful people, like they just can't let something go. I've got to show that, I'm, that I know what I'm talking about. I got to prove that I'm, I'm right. I remember seeing a comic a while back which showed a man at his computer late at night, his wife calling from the bedroom, time to come to bed, and he shouts back, how can I go to bed when someone on the internet is wrong? (laughs) Um, Perhaps you feel that sometimes. It's like, there's someone wrong and they need to be corrected. I need to show that I'm right. I need to show that this is best. I've got to prove them wrong and all too often these types of discussions when that's your motive when that's your what your heart all too often arguments like that lead to all heat and no light you know it's all friction and no progress no growth no increased understanding and so so here paul isn't telling timothy to stop defending the gospel but to not stoop to the level of others who only want to fight. And so he says in verse 23, don't have anything to do with foolish and stupid arguments because you know that you know they produce quarrels and the Lord's servant must not quarrel. Don't, don't give in to that. Defend the gospel. I mean, he, that, that's one of the main points of 2 Timothy. We saw in chapter 1, verse 13, What you've heard from me, keep as the pattern of sound teaching. Guard the good deposit that was entrusted to you. Guard it with the help of the Holy Spirit who lives in you. Like He is encouraging Timothy to defend the faith and to teach and correct these false teachers. But don't stoop to their level in how you do it. Recognize when, when someone is uncorrectable, unteachable, not really looking for insight and understanding. Uh, you, you can often find people who are actually wanting to learn. If, if you answer one of their questions, if they go, oh, wow, thank you. Like, here's someone who wants to learn. If you answer their question and they go to, but what about, 
And there's, you know, they've got, you know, a, a bag full of but what abouts. You know, no matter how many questions you answer, well, but what about this? Well, but what about this? And like, okay, here is someone who's not actually looking to learn. They're not actually seeking the truth. It's just someone who's determined to prove themselves right. You think, Timothy, don't even bother. Don't even jump into these foolish and stupid arguments. Have the wisdom to recognize. Um, you, you like defend the gospel, stand for it, but but flee the evil desires of youth in how you approach and correct other people. And notice um, that these things need to be cultivated, fleeing the evil desires of youth, pursuing righteousness, faith, love, and peace. Notice what it says. It says, do this along with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Along with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Uh, You can't do this alone. You need God's people. If you're going to flee sin, if you're going to flee temptation, and if you're going to pursue what is uh, righteous and loving and full of faith, um, if you're going to do that, you need God's people around you helping you in that way as we pursue these things, as we flee uh, sin. God's not creating lone rangers, but we need the body of Christ. We need each other to to, to seek after God together. And so together, cleansed people pursue righteousness. That is conformity to God's will. As communicated in his word, as demonstrated in Christ, we, we, we want to be conformed. We want to obey his word. We want to do what he wants. It's not, obe- it's not legalism to be obedient. Uh, some churches, if you're really striving to obey God, others will say, oh, that's just legalism. Obedience is not legalism. Legalism is when you obey in order to earn God's approval, in order to make God obligated to do things for you, in order to, to look good in front of others. It's, it, legalism is about your motive uh, more than anything else. Obedience is like, I want to be in conformity with God's will. So I want to know what his word says. I want to do what he says. I want to live like Jesus Christ. Cleansed people pursue righteousness. And together we pursue faith. Encouraging each other to believe in a big God. You know, when our sights are low, when our dreams are puny, together we, we kind of lift each other's eyes to say, God can do more than that. Don't give up. Trust in his promises. We, we embolden each other to believe, to have more faith, to look to God as being the incredibly big God that he is. And together we pursue love, putting others ahead of ourselves. Uh, trying to put to death our own selfishness and laziness. We pursue, we're, we pursue love, sacrificing and, and building up others. And together we pursue peace. You have to pursue peace. Like peace doesn't naturally happen. Uh, the, the natural state of things, if left to themselves, will be the opposite of peace. Um, you know, the, the, the things will just kind of like gradually dissipate into conflict unless you pursue peace and actively put energy into it. The world's way of dealing with conflict is to avoid it, to nurse feelings, to spread gossip, to stand up for your rights. God's way is to go directly to the one offended, to seek forgiveness, to apologize, to try to gain understanding in order to be reconciled. One of the things I find interesting about this point Uh, Matthew 5, uh, Jesus makes the point that if a brother or sister has something against you um, when when you're bringing your offering, uh, your your gift to God or to the temple or whatever, and if someone has something against you, you leave your gift there, you go and you be reconciled to your brother or sister. And a few pages later, you get to Matthew 18, where there Jesus says, if you have something against your brother or sister... You go to them, you address it in love, you, you, you kind of confront them in their sin and you try to bring about repentance and reconciliation. Biblically, it makes no difference who is the offended party, who is in the right, who is in the wrong. It, you, you can't just say, well, that's their issue and they're going to deal with it, I'm fine, whatever. 
It doesn't matter if you are the one in the wrong, if they are the one in the wrong. Either way, the burden is on you to go deal with it and bring about that reconciliation. Nobody can say, well, it's that person's responsibility. Whether they're offended or whether you're offended at them, Jesus says, go and deal with it. Pursue peace. Put energy into it. The burden is always on us to go deal with it. How do we do that? What does that look like to together flee evil desires of youth and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace along with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart? Uh, the, The remainder of this passage spells that out. We looked at verse 23, which spells out what it means to flee the evil desires of youth, that we don't have anything to do with foolish and stupid arguments. But then verses 24 to 26 begin to spell out some of what it looks like to pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace. It says, the Lord's servant must not quarrel. Instead, he must be kind to everyone, able to teach, not resentful. Those who oppose him, he must gently instruct in the hope that God will grant them repentance, leading them to a knowledge of the truth and that they will come to their senses and escape from the trap of the devil who has taken them captive to do his will. This is what it looks like to, with the body of Christ, pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace. It means you're seeking people out to be reconciled, but you're doing it with kindness. You're doing it with an ability to teach and explain. You're not being resentful when things get heated or when you're not treated well. The the, the instruction is done with a a, a gentleness. Um, It's not belligerent. You're not Bible bashing them, showing them how they're wrong. There's a gentleness in your approach that communicates, I love you. I care about you. I'm approaching you not because it's fun to experience conflict, but because I love you enough to want to come alongside you and speak the truth into your life. I don't know about you, but I don't want to be in a church that's too timid to speak the truth in love. I don't want to be in a church where other Christians aren't willing to come alongside me and say, Caleb, it seems like you might be off in this way. Caleb, it it bothered me when you said this or did that. I want a church that that loves me enough to, to do that. And I hope that you want a church that wants that from others and wants that from the elders. That you want people to ask about how you're doing and what's going on in your life. You want people to confront you, to rebuke you, to correct you, to encourage you. I hope that you want that from the body of Christ here. That's God's desire for us. That's what it means to together pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace. I want to end by pointing out verse 26. To to notice that all of this is being done while a spiritual battle is taking place. Satan has trapped people and taken them captive to do his will. And they don't realize it. So that, you know, that they'll come to their senses and escape from the trap of the devil. That, that phrase, come to their senses, literally means to become sober. Like you were in a drunken stupor and all of a sudden you kind of snap out of it. The hangover fades and all of a sudden you're clear again. And so the picture that's going on here is that there are people who are uh, in the trap of the devil. They are captive doing his will, but they're in such a a stupor about it, whether it's as if Satan has drugged them um, or made them drunk in some way so that they're doing his will, they're his captives, and they're completely oblivious to it. They think they're totally free. They think they're doing everything they want. The bad part is their heart has been so corrupted that them doing what they want is exactly what Satan wants. And so there's the spiritual warfare going on as he has taken people hostage and we are called to step into the fray and to rescue and to redeem. We become mediators of reconciliation that, that, that bring people to God, that help, to, uh, help them to address their sin, to recognize their state and to cry out to God for mercy. Now we can't do that on our own. He says explicitly in verse 25, You know, that we must gently instruct, that's our part, in the hope that God will grant them repentance. That's his part. I can't make anyone repent. 
Uh, that, that, that's out of our hands. There's some sovereign work that God needs to do for him to intervene and take out a heart of stone and to put in a heart of flesh. God does that work. God brings about the repentance, but he does it primarily through cleansed vessels. People like you and me who are not perfect vessels, uh, who still have some rough edges, who are still needing to be cleansed in an ongoing way as we give in to temptation or whatever uh, you might particularly struggle with. We are not perfect people, but as we are cleansed, as we are doing our best with the body of Christ to flee sin and pursue godliness, God says, that's who I want to use. That's the kind of person that I want to use. doesn't matter how, how big of a following you have, how popular you are, how rich you are, how much influence you have. When you are submitted to God, when you are fleeing sin and pursuing godliness, God says, it's you that I want to use. I'm going to bring about the repentance, but it's when you step up and become my mouthpiece, my hands extending love and care and support to those around you. Today we are sending off Cal uh, O'Donohue, and I'm just so grateful for this privilege as a church uh, that we get to send her off, uh, that we get to pray for her and support her. Um, And my word to you, Cal, as you go, um, I hope is an encouragement from this passage is that you don't have to be the most eloquent person ever. You don't have to be rich and powerful. You don't have to have every degree. But are you going to be a cleansed vessel? Are you going to be someone who flees sin and pursues godliness? Are you going to be someone who daily confesses of your sin and draws closer to him and wants to be available to him that you would be a gold or silver vessel cleansed and ready to go for whatever good work the master would have for you? And as I say that to her, I hope that we are a church that recognizes that it's not missionaries and the lay people, like, like that God has big things for them and we just sit back and watch from a distance going, go you, keep going. Uh, hopefully there is some encouragement from a distance, but God asks the same level of obedience, the same level of cleansing, the same willingness to be submissive, the same wholeheartedness in fleeing sin and pursuing godliness. He asks that of each of us. I hope that we don't hold Cal to a a standard that we ourselves are not striving for, a a level of submission that says, if you call, I will go. I'm not going to argue with you, God. I'm not going to debate with you. I'm not going to fight you and and be like Jonah and flee in the opposite direction. Whatever you want, God, I'm in. I pray that Cal has that mindset just as we here preserve that same mindset. Let's pray together. Father God, God, we thank you that you allow us to be a part of accomplishing your purposes, that though you could bring about repentance simply on your own, leaving us on the sidelines, Father God, I thank you that you call us out to get in the game, to run out onto the field, and that you stand ready to bless those who are submitted to you. I pray for Cal and I pray for us that we would be those kinds of, of people, that we wouldn't be sitting on the sidelines, but that we'd be engaged, that we'd be serving, that we'd be pursuing righteousness and faith and love and peace and, and running away from sin, not hanging out in it or playing with it. God, help us to be cleansed vessels that everyone in this room might be a, a tool useful in your hands, ready to serve, cleansed and ready to go, that at a moment's notice, we'd be accomplishing your purposes wherever we might be. Help us, God. In your name we pray. Amen.